Our next panel is on the future of civic learning, and our moderator is the former board chair for the National Civic League and now the board chair for the National League of Cities, not to be confused with our organization, although we're about the same number of years old there, 100, 100 years old this year. Uh, so um, uh, moderating the next panel is the mayor of Rancho Cordova, California, and the chair of the National League of Cities, David Sander. Thank you, Doug. Well, it is a pleasure to be here, and we have a wonderful panel with us this morning, who I'm now going to introduce. We have Raj Vinokata. He is president of the Institute for Citizens and Scholars. Raj, come on up and join us. We have Louise, Louise Dubay, CEO of iCivics. And David Bob, who is president of the Bill of Rights Institute. All right, welcome panel. And it was good to see so many people stayed here in the audience. You know, sometimes people wander off for coffee. I just want to assure you, this is going to be the exciting panel of the event. No need for coffee in the room, because we have a very important charge, which is civic education. So rather than do some uh, introduction that's sort of academic, I'm going to give you a very practical introduction and ask you to reflect on it. So. I am mayor of the city of Rancho Cordova, been on the city council for 21 years, um, and it is a new city, although it formed in an old community. So the county thought they could be a city, counties never do that well. We incorporated, became a city. Had no city infrastructure of any kind, we had to build it all up. Maybe five years into that process, a bunch of citizens came to us and said, we want an arts program at the city. Now this is pretty common, you know, for cities, they have arts councils, et cetera. And they said, we want an arts council, and we want your city staff to create it, and we'll have monthly meetings, and council members can appoint people to the arts council, and there'll be publicly noticed meetings, and we can keep records of all that, and talk about art things, and maybe we can have an art show. And our city's approach is a little different from other cities, and we said, uh, love the idea, we're absolutely in support of the arts, but we do not want you to do it through our bureaucracy, because we don't, frankly, want the bureaucracy. We want you to go to a nonprofit partner of ours and do it there. And so they did. And they got together and they said, what's the easiest thing we can do? Well, we'll do an art show. And the nonprofit partner, tapping into people's loves and passions, arranged that quickly. Now I'm going to fast forward so the story isn't too long. You know, 10 years later, 15 years later, we now have a philharmonic in our community. We have, uh, we're about 83,000 people. Um, we have a philharmonic of our own. We have a concert band. We have two uh, theater groups. We have one focused on kids, two focused on adults. We've remodeled one of our most historic buildings into an arts venue, so sort of uh, gallery space below. We constantly have rotating art shows. We have arts programs in our schools. I mean, we've hosted Smithsonian exhibitions in my city of 83,000. <laughs> None of that could have been planned by government, frankly, uh, or executed by government, but by tapping into the passions of all those people, it was all possible. No, no one could have planned that, but by allowing people to pursue it, by brokering, catalyzing, facilitating it, that sort of thing can happen. So that's my story, one story, about civic engagement and civic education, because the people involved in that had to obviously have some education about what they could and couldn't do and what the city could do to help rather than do. So I just want you to sort of reflect on that in your own work and, and give, us some, give us some thoughts. Go ahead, David. Well, thank you for that, and thanks uh, for this opportunity to, to reflect on this topic. You know, what I'm struck by is that if you're teaching civics, it ought to be about civil society as well as government. And sometimes now, if you look out at what happens in curricula, it's only about government. And I think students then understand that the only solution path might be that way. But in fact, so much of what we do in our daily lives, that's a great example that you just shared, is about a mixture of both what's happening in the governmental sphere and the civil society sphere. Uh, the Bill of Rights Institute supports a national network of 75,000 educators in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. These teachers are doing immensely difficult work now. I know we'll be able to unpack a little bit more about the challenges that are there, but just think about the day in a life of a teacher who's trying to bring topics in history or current events to a classroom 
of young people who now we know, owing to a Stanford University study and kind of common sense, are polarized as young as 11. Bringing up a topic like immigration or what's happening in the news today should be something that is the mainstay of what we do in civic education and civic learning. But in fact, it's very difficult and the teacher's job is incredibly difficult today. That's why at the Bill of Rights Institute we exist to help support them in that effort, give them the curricular resources, the professional learning programs. And I'll mention very briefly just one program that I think ties into what, uh, what you just asked, David. The, the, my Impact Challenge is a national science fair for civics. And what we've seen is when young people are challenged, 13 to 19, to take up a problem in their local community, not trying to boil the ocean, start with your local community, identify and state clearly what the problem is, and then don't just think about a hypothetical solution. Get going. Do it. Oftentimes what students uh, we find in this competition is we've rolled it out nationally. They'll fail a couple of times. That's okay. One woman who, a uh, young woman who, who won in Utah actually started a, a, a program called Title I Strings. And she, on her own, started an organization trying to take what she had come to love in playing the violin and bringing that to young people in her community who didn't have in their families the resources to support lessons. And that's the kind of thing I think that we ought to reward. Just as you said, she had to have knowledge in order to do that, right? So that was something that is the groundwork. But then she's kind of flexing some muscles, new, challenging. She's developing those skills. And ultimately, that's going to issue in a disposition. We hope that it is going to be as a lifelong problem solver. So I think there's a lot to um, what, what you're saying. We have to reorient civics to civil society as much as education about government. Louise, I think you might have some examples. Yeah. Um, so I'm the CEO of iCivics, and we teach about 9 million students a year, uh, a lot of free resources online you can access. Um, and I think I, I want to make the case that it's not possible to have a liberal democracy, a small l, without civic learning. This is not a skill you start out with. Self-government is not something that just magically appears. You have to build it. Um, and, and originally, uh, we had a civic mission of schools. That was the purpose. We've drifted yeah. so far away from that that now we have about 15 minutes or so in elementary classrooms. Um, ask yourself what you can do with 15 minutes a week. Uh, not too much. So. Uh, to illustrate that point, we, we do work with a lot of different programs, but one of them is our Civic uh, Service Leadership Program. As part of that, I just want to tell you the story of Josiah and Donovan. And they, they uh, are in a classroom in Prince William uh, County, and they looked at their own situation. They had a friend who had a broken leg. And sometimes we think civic learning, it's this kind of amorphous thing. It really is not. They had a friend with a broken leg. Uh, and he was trying to get to class, couldn't get there on time. You know how tight the schedules are in high school, right? You have to get from one place to the other. There was no ramp, and there was no accessibility. And so the two kids, they went and looked at how many uh, parking spaces. They counted the parking spaces. They had 350. The ADA, the, the compliance law, requires you to have eight uh, accessible parking spaces, but they only had six. They were way out of compliance. And then, it, amazingly, these kids timed how long it took for an abled person to get there and how long it took for their friends or others who had, were on crutches. Um, and it was like a factor of four or something. And then they studied how you might do it. It costs 90000 to 100000 to get a ramp, okay? Uh, how would you get that money? It turns out the county had some liability to comply to the ADA, so therefore there was some ability there. They didn't actually get it done within the class time period, but it, was, it elevated an out-of-compliance situation nobody ever thought about. So this is just really practically, how do you help people? You help people by organizing. You help people by getting together with other people. There's a lot of talk about personalization and individual action. Uh, there's, you need a group action in order to make change. So I'll leave it there for now. Raj, you're dealing with a different level of student and institution, but I'm sure you can reflect on the same story I told. 
Absolutely, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with my friends uh, and those in the audience. So I work at the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, uh, and the way in which we talk about our work is that there are 68 million young people between the ages of 10 and 24 who in the next decade are entering the public square. And if we do a good job of developing them into the well-informed, productively engaged, and committed to democracy citizens that we need them to be, that we're going to be fine as a country. And that it is our job to ensure that they meet what we call the big three. And as soon as you think about kind of civic development, civic learning, civic preparedness in this broader conception, uh, you quickly understand that schools are an important dimension of that, but you also need to work well beyond the K-12 system. You need to work uh, at home, in your communities, uh, in your uh, places of worship. You need to work in higher education, at your first place of work, and certainly online and through social media. And so part of the way in which we approach this is we have great friends who are doing the hard work in K-12. We support them, and we're also trying to figure out how we can play in these other spaces. Um, and one of the ways in which we started to engage on that is actually during the early stages of the pandemic is to figure out how we could support young people who directly were interested in making a difference in their communities and really needed the support to develop the capacities and the knowledge and the skills to do that. I'll give you an example of what we did. We call them the Civic Spring Fellows. Um, two young men in Minnesota uh, recognized very early in the pandemic that uh, high school students are not eligible for unemployment benefits in Minnesota. I understand why. There's probably many good reasons for that. But unfortunately, the, uh, the federal government was ch channeling all of its funding for pandemic-related support through the unemployment benefit mechanism, which suddenly meant that many uh, wage earners, sometimes the primary wage earner in families, was not eligible for any of the COVID benefits in the state of Minnesota. And so these two young men applied to us as part of the Civic Spring Fellowship, saying that they wanted to create legislative change in the state. We looked at their application, we looked at them, we said, wow, this is quite an undertaking. Not sure if they're going to pull it off, but to both of your points, let's go support them. And so they actually were able to build a coalition and did all the work of understanding how they needed to change legislation. They took it to the state and they didn't succeed. But they learned enough to actually be able to, in this coalition, to recognize that they also had a legal uh, approach that they may be that they could undertake and they were able to actually go through the judicial branch and be able to get this law changed so that they were able to get 30 million dollars in back pay to high school students throughout the state of Minnesota now that's just one example right and you can talk about it local community state community and so on they worked with the coalition they learned what the legislation was like they learned about the judicial process and then they were able to create true change true concrete change in their community you know, Robert uh, Putnam had a very acclaimed book, Bowling Alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think we're probably all familiar with that at, at some level. Uh, it sort of charted civic engagement, you know, over, over centuries, really. But in particular, you know, the conclusion is, you know, these things are cyclic. They can have a 30-year cycle of sort of peak of engagement to pit of engagement. Um, and he charted the most recent apogee of that at 1972 which was a maximum for you know, membership in fill-in-the-blank organization, maximum for sports leagues and, and all sorts of measures of engagement, church membership, chamber of commerce membership, et cetera. So I haven't seen a lot of data that suggests we've sort of come out of the decline that follows an epigy like that, but do you have any uh, feeling from your work of where we might be on that sort of a, of a cycle? David, you want to take a shot at that? You know, I don't think we're out of that cycle. I think we may actually have dug uh, more deeply. And, you know, there's a couple of data points that might tie in. I was thinking about recently, we're all probably pretty connected to just how uh, extraordinary the polarization and really what is a kind of hyper-politicization uh, has happened. In the 1960s, married couples shared political party alignment about 60% of the time. Today, it's close to 85%. Now think about the apple falling from the, uh, uh, the tree. Uh, you know, you think children kind of want to dissent from their parents, right, want to chart a different course. In 1980, children agreed with their parents about their political party ID 56% of the time. By uh, 2019, that figure had grown to 81%. So we are not only doing these things individually, but we've self-sorted. Mm. And we're bowling in leagues, and our bowling team is only people with whom we disagree. 
and it, other, it, it otherwise has characteristics that just reinforce whatever you believe. So I think one of the challenges we face in the K-12 space, and I uh, assume this, this exists all across the sectors, is we need to interact with people in meaningful ways and have those interactions help change and challenge what we believe. And so we've constructed some programs at the Bill of Rights Institute that try to do that, but I think it's going to take, a, as you said, Raj, an effort across all sectors because this self-sorting has become so profound. So it's sort of a cognitive dissonance approach, right, where you inject a thought so contrary to their, what they see in their bubble that they question the bubble. I think so, so yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I didn't mean, do you want, okay. Go ahead, Raj. So, one of the big pieces of work that we do is trying to figure out how we can create a kind of a measurement structure for this whole space. How do you actually go about measuring civic preparedness? And one of the projects that we just undertook and came out with in September was a survey of 4,000 young people ages 18 to 24 across many of these concepts that we're talking about. There's a lot to be worried about. I'll set that aside for a moment. Um, but actually, part of the good news with that population is they're twice as more likely to want to engage with people with different points of view than the general population. Now, I want to stipulate that. They're at 37%. The general population is at 22%, right? So it's not like we're all in a great place to begin with. But that population is certainly more interested. The other thing that we're seeing with that population is that they're not nearly as, to use a term, David, I don't know if you actually even said these words, but it, mm -hmm. it certainly suggested to me, not nearly as tribal mm -hmm. as uh, some you know, other parts of our society. So, let me give you two examples. 51% um, of them consider themselves to be either moderates, just center left, or just center right, right, in terms of their thinking and so on. So we have these conceptions of the younger population being incredibly on one end of the spectrum or the other. That's not actually the case. In fact, only 23% of them see, uh, uh, say that they're Democrats, 17% say they're Republicans, the rest say that they don't align with a political party. You can read that in many different ways, but one of the ways that you can read it when you look at some of the other data is they're really solution-oriented, right? They really just want to address these, as they see them, existential set of issues that our society is struggling with, and they're willing to work with anyone towards in, in common cause. So we are starting to see, at least with this population, a desire to try to solve problems irrespective of what tribe they may be coming from. So Louise, you bring in some great policy background. Um, and you told a story just a second ago, you know, about how kids sort of organized to do this. Putnam's hypothesis is sort of that, you know, this, we're in a, a rise of individualism as opposed to corporatism or communityism. Mm -hmm. wow. um, we're focused on the individual. So in that sort of policy sphere, do you see opportunities there for sort of turning that around? Because that is the punchline of Putnam's book. We need to find ways to turn this around, and I think we're all probably here working on that in one way or another, but awesome. you've got a particular view. Yeah, and so I would say a couple things. Um, first of all, civic learning does not exist outside of how our democracy or our system of government works. Mm -hmm. So think of a teacher, a K-12 teacher, trying to teach about something that then the students see not working to solve mm -hmm. problems outside of the classroom. And then you've got a bit of a problem there, right? Um, and the problem is really complex because you actually have to motivate students to do something so that you hold the institution as accountable to actually do work, right? And you have to respect the principles by which you do that in order to get somewhere. There is no uh, la long lasting legislation in this country uh, and improvement that hasn't been bipartisan, right? That's something that kids forget sometimes, but yet at this point, what they see is dysfunction, right? We all see the same thing. So this is a, a real tension in our work, and it's a tension we need to overcome. But what I see is the same as what Raj is saying, which is that uh, there's a huge um, divide between young people and the older generations, one of them is the level of patriotism or attachment to the country, but another one is about collectivism, or that's a, maybe the, the wrong word, but a sense that you're your brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. And that, that sense is, is very prevalent among the younger generation. And so in that way, we need to make that possible. So what you're, um, the other thing I will mention is that 
the role of information technology or, or technology in this process of separating us, it's like vast, right? So that's a whole topic in itself. Um, but what we believe is that if, if you create the conditions for civic learning inside of, uh, from cradle to grave all throughout, but I work particularly in K-12 as does Dave, David, and that requires policy. There is nothing you can do in schools that isn't mandated in some way and is policy. So we at iCivics started to realize that the 15 minutes in the classroom is not going to get you prepared and engaged citizens in this country uh, who are attached enough to be able to make changes. And that would requ it required us to start a coalition we called Civics Now. And that coalition now has grown to 320 member organizations across all viewpoints. So you have folks who are uh, really conservative and folks who are really progressive. And that is really important to us because that's baked into the system. So that uh, set of policy work does work at the federal level. We were able to triple the amount of funding uh, to civic learning, uh, history and civic learning uh, through uh, an appropriations. And that's really starting to pay off. And then we do work in 40 states with state coalitions. So our coalitions are locally driven and they cover teachers, museums, and all different kinds of organizations. And there are bills that then are primarily designed to do a lot of different things. Uh, mandates for courses, training for educators, connections to communities, con connections to uh, in uh, civic engagement of all sorts. And I think that's a, you, you can talk about, the, it's a, a two-way street, right? You need to have the conditions there. That will aggregate enough so that you have all students get a civic education, and that might be a way to, to change. We also need many other things to happen, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, the work at the higher level, the work on the political level, all different things need to happen, but this is one way to turn the crank. That's very good. And you also mentioned, well, here we are in Washington, D.C., and this is a nonpartisan issue. This is a, a point of partisan agreement that this kind of education is necessary. So part of the, the focus of this conference, obviously, is the future. And I was sitting in the last session about AI, and I thought, you know, maybe we should ask ChatGPT what I should ask <laughs> the yeah. panelists up here. I'm, I'm not kidding. I actually did do that while sitting there. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to use those questions. Um, Artificial intelligence, and you know, we can debate what that means, generative, non-generative, it's going to have an impact in this sphere. Um, it's also an incredibly powerful tool for education if used, if used properly. What sort of skills do we need in order to maximize the benefit of that? How do, we, how do we need to sort of prepare ourselves or our <laughs> systems to work with that? I, I can start it out. I, I, to be honest, nobody knows. So let's just start Excellent there and answer. lower expectations. Next question. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I think when you think about artificial intelligence in the context of our work in K-12, uh, a lot of folks are really excited about it. So one, they cite all sorts of efficiency benefits. You know, educators are not going to have to do grading anymore, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, they cite uh, personalization as a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. So you can have your own little tutor. Uh, if you're a Star Wars geek, you're going to have it, you know, give you Star Wars example. That's all fine. Uh, I worry about the fact that personalization and connection, the, the topic you started with, those things are very different. Mm -hmm. So my, my hope would be that we'd find a way to have uh, AI be a connecting tool. If that is the work, the work of civic <coughs> learning is to solve problems together. And right now, uh, that's not clear how we're going to be able to do that. But if ChatGPT or some other BARD or something were to allow us to find other people who are interested in our issue or be able to connect us in some way with the knowledge and the skills and the dispositions to do that, I think that could be a really useful thing. The other topic which also came up at the prior uh, panel is this issue of mis- and disinformation. This is something that is no longer separate from civic learning. It's no longer separate from our democracy. Um, and it's really hard 
to, to know what to teach about it when you don't understand it yourself, right? And that is the position of almost all K-12 educators right now. And the level of research, the, we, we have a big project in this area, and there's research, but there's not enough research because the technology keeps improving at rates that are very hard for current research protocols. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to do research and, um, and a structure that we don't have. We don't have a base level of, of technology from which... Uh, so what I would say about AI is that we do need an enormous more, amount more of uh, research in this field and that the best thing you can do right now is to educate educators. Uh, they need the skills. They, they cannot dismiss it and they cannot be afraid. They need to be able to use it because otherwise we'll be the whole... The generation will be way ahead of educators. So that, that's what I would suggest. David? The Bill of Rights Institute is an open education resource publisher. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, OER has really brought about a, a revolution. You know, college students are no longer very willing at all to pay for a $400 textbook. They'll sooner take out their phone and take a picture of 400 pages than pay 400 bucks. <laughs> High school students, middle school students, still are handed textbooks, their teachers are at least, paid for by the taxpayer, often an extraordinary expense, right? In Texas, they spend $400 million alone on textbooks. So the students don't have the same reason to revolt because of price. The price is, is absorbed by the taxpayer. What we found is that teachers take those textbooks often because they're so crummy and set them aside. And they let them gather dust in the corner. And they go online and they try to figure out, let's pull from BRI, let's pull from iCivics, let's pull from a whole array of institutions, uh, uh, resources rather, and, and YouTube, right? And they curate, they're entrepreneurial. They curate a curriculum for their students because they know who those students are. One of the challenges that I think we see and the initial move by many districts to ban ChatGPT, utter folly. We should embrace it. We should do it with lots of concern, though, and I share some of the concerns that you raised, Luis, and I'd add one. I think as we look at the ideological valence of the various large language models, I could imagine a future in which we say, you know, so as to not ruffle feathers, kind of like we do sometimes now in the classroom, where we shy away from engagement and viewpoint diversity. You might say, well, wherever you fall on the political spectrum, why don't you choose the avatar that kind of represents where you are, and we'll give you the world through that vision, through that, through that vector. I think that would be very consequential for, for, for our students because one of the things that we strive to do at the Bill of Rights Institute with our open education resources is point-counterpoint so that students are always being challenged. You're, they're hearing from scholars who can, who can talk in plain language, not jargon, talk about real-world challenges both from yesteryear and today and in the future, and, and, and bring a kind of fruitful conversation. And I think that, that there's a whole array of problems that we could talk about. I do think um, one little uh, uh, kind of data point that I found interesting, you know, ChatGPT's uh, 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 sort of um, traffic tapered off in the month of June. Why do you suppose that was? <laughs> I think it's because school's out, right? So all of these efforts to ban it or kind of ignore it Utter folly. Students are turning to it in mass, and they're using it, and it requires a wholesale reconsideration of how we're going to, uh, to teach. So, David, uh, I do a lot of work in higher education, working with a large group of college presidents about how to recenter civic preparedness on their campus and work with a lot of faculty. And this question of social media, information literacy, media literacy, chat GPT, AI comes up. Um, and I've been struggling with it, and over the last, even just the last few weeks, I've been trying to work out this conception that actually in some ways gives me some comfort, so I'm just going to share it with you, um, which is these are all different channels of thinking and worrying about the critical thinking skills that we're developing in our young people. And so how can we develop the, those skills to question and to go two levels deeper, to try to figure out where that information came from or how you got something, to be able to kind of build that curiosity through practice, 
right, which we can do in K-12, in higher education, uh, in the workplace, so on and so forth, so that you ask the follow-up question, right? And because technology is going to move so fast, in some ways I revert to kind of more of the basic fundamental pieces that I don't think will change. And one of them is we've got to get all people, but certainly the young people we work with, to just be more critical in how they approach any information. And so, you know, AI is going to go faster than we can keep up with it, but these skills, I think, can be applied in any scenario. Yeah, that's very good. You know, I'm a scientist by training, uh, physics, physics as an undergraduate, so uh -huh. a ton of math. When I was in school, even graduate school, um, there were programs out there that you could put equations into to be solved, and it would automatically happen. So it's kind of funny to me, in a way, <laughs> that the math world has been doing this for a generation, and now that we move over to sort of the, the art side, the writing side, everyone's in a, in a sort of moral panic about it. But the mathematicians and scientists have kind of figured it out already. We can live with this. It's just a useful tool. But one last question before we go to questions from, from you all. Um, you know, we're bringing together an interesting group of people here at this conference. So you've got national focus, local focus. Mm -hmm. And one critical question is, you know, how do you bridge the, uh, the difference there, you know, that, those different levels of government? Um, you know, speaking personally, I've worked at the federal level. I've spent a lot of time now at the local level. Mm -hmm. At the national level, you want things to be orderly, you know, so you set up a nice, defined, clear program. Gets all the way down to grassroots. It's dumb. I mean, just put a fine point on it. It looks dumb. It doesn't fit. <laughs> There's 19,000 cities and towns. You can't come up with one federal formula and say that's going to work everywhere. It's nonsense. Contrary to that, if you do it from the grassroots up, mm -hmm. let them make the decisions, it's going to be smart at the grassroots level, but by the time you get up to the top level, it's going to be total chaos, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're looking down on it or looking at it. So how do, you, how do you think we best bridge that, particularly given that, you know, legislation is possible in this area? How would you sort of try to bridge that gap and find a, find a happy medium? I think the, the, the chaos of federalism is a... Is a is a feature, a not a bug. Exactly. I, I think it's You just I think set him up great. for that, didn't you? Yeah, it was a, uh, And, you know, <laughs> favorite topic. Luis and I uh, agree on a lot, and, and I'll, I'll point you all to Educating for American Democracy if you want to see a great example of a roadmap that brings civics and history together in a way that is, that is uh, truly nonpartisan, cross-ideological. But, you know, I'll, I'll say of the national effort and national funding, I'm very wary of it just because I think that top-down approach actually is the place where the chaos is introduced. Because 80% of the American people want education to be a local thing. And we've seen what No Child Left Behind did. No Child Left Behind is one of the reasons why we have 15 minutes per week for civics. And so I'm wary of that funding coming from this town and entered uh, energized by the efforts of local communities to come together and re-knit the bonds of trust. That's where it's broken down. You shouldn't dial an 800 number, drop a dime on your teacher, your kid's teacher, if you disagree with what's happening. You should go in and have coffee with your kid's teacher and try to figure out what do we do about viewpoint diversity? How do we uphold the needs of our educators and students? And I think there's a lot of that energy that's out there right now. And I think whatever we can do to, uh, to make that flourish will be, will be good. I will note that David lives in this town and I don't. No, just, so, no. <laughs> just saying. Um, uh, I, I, I think we agree on the end goal mm -hmm. and we disagree on, on and that, that happens a lot, right, on, on the tactics uh, of how to do that. Uh, one of the things I worry about most is um, equity across the states. And so um, the federal government can uh, distribute resources in ways that are much more equ equitable. The point is, though, that those decisions uh, should not be made in Washington, D.C. They should be, the, the resources should be provided as close to the ground as possible so that school districts or museums or information learning, civic learning space, make their own decisions about what's useful for their communities. So we have state-based efforts and we have national-based efforts. And that is because education is primarily a state-based effort, right? So most of our effort goes to the states. Uh, but there is an equity uh, and a priority because realistically, our safety as a nation is directly related to our having a functional democracy. And I will say, if we fall, uh, the, the consequences of that worldwide are very serious. 
Therefore, the national government has a direct interest in this issue. That, so, uh, so yes, but uh, is my answer. <laughs> Raj. So there might be an analog, not sure, in the work that we're doing right now with higher education, right? Because in the higher education space, you basically got thousands of institutions that really are their own bosses. You have some accreditation and so on, but largely they're their own bosses. And what we're reckoning with there is a need to create new ways of thinking about civic preparedness on college campuses and coming together kind of collectively to both tout that, to share the lessons being learned, to generate kind of the new pathways that people can look at. But that only gets you part of the way. There needs to be some mechanisms for pressure for other schools to want to change, right? Part of it is if you can create models, other people will say, why aren't we doing that, mm -hmm. right? But you also need, in this case, local communities to decide that they want to do it, right? In the end, you need to get the local communities to decide that. But hopefully by creating models, by being able to say, come be part of this movement, you can hopefully get more people to join. Very good. And with that, we're going to go to audience questions. So we've got microphones, one or perhaps two in the room. Go right ahead. Thank you all. Uh, my work is preparing teachers, um, and what we know from uh, data is, uh, and from my own personal experience, that teachers are really afraid right now um, of leading the kind of conversations. And that's in the K-12 and also in higher ed, um, particularly on, among uh, adjunct and non-tenure track faculty. Um, and it's leading them to uh, take wonderful curriculum like what uh, your organization has developed and uh, take out the maybe critical parts of it and, and adjust it and avoid some of the conversations and also ultimately avoid coming into teaching at all. So I'm wondering if you all could comment a little bit on what we need to do to support teachers to actually lead the kinds of classrooms that we need. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, this is a huge issue and I don't think there's any doubt on this. Um, uh, teachers are afraid and, um, and the kids are not all right and you know, there's, there's serious problems here. So um, our sense of what it will take to change this is for those, so we have a divide along political lines. We also have a divide between those who care and those who don't. And we all know from reading all these books why that is. Um, but those who care now have hijacked, in some cases, the system or the communications tool. So those, uh, there are ways to change that narrative by having folks who are influential in their circles take up the issue of, in, in a non-polarized way, and talk about the importance of civic learning and the importance of critical thinking and the importance of pluralism and the importance of uh, discussions about controversial issues in classrooms and make your voices heard, right? So enough of having the political system being hijacked. Let's have a uh, regular folks talk to their school districts about why this is important to them. That will reduce the burden on educators who are just, for the most part, trying to do the right thing, right? They're just trying to take the state standards and check them off and trying to t teach the best that they can. And I, we really need uh, to not make them political actors because that is not their job. David? The strange thing is, you know, in both red, blue, and purple places all across this country, the evidence is pretty clear that most parents are extremely skeptical of entrusting state legislators, let alone national uh, legislators, with curricular decisions. So housing it, situating those decisions at the local level, think of what a teacher goes through now. Half the states, there's already uh, strictures in place, right? So that's a, that's a chilling effect. We are not going to ban our way out of the problem of polarization or politicization, on the opposite. We have to re-knit those bonds of local trust. But oftentimes a teacher, if they don't even have that stricture in place, they get a letter that's sent out from the superintendent from the legal counsel, let's not have any melees, let's not have any trouble. They get the signal, right? Don't talk about the toughest issues. So that's what they do. You're exactly right that they are pulling the, the difficult parts out. They go to the anodyne parts. We need to have parents stand up and actually say we want and will support educators in the difficult act of doing viewpoint diversity. This is what we mean by that. 
We need a superintendent and a building principal and a school board who then does it. And I think it's that kind of local action that can actually lead to change. It also struck me recently, you know, you see all of these school board meetings where people come and stand and the school board members are all kind of doing, sort of looking around, right? We have this three minutes, three minutes, three minutes. That is the opposite of deliberation. So there's some structural things that are really at, at, at a, right. um, a, a complete breaking point. We're long ago, and we need to reinstill that kind of sense and get superintendents and building principals that actually want to have real town halls, not fake ones. Yeah. Well, Raj, thank goodness the universities have escaped all of this controversy. <laughs> let, let me just add one little thing to this, and then I'll I'm glad people <laughs> laughed at that, by the way. <laughs> um, schools are now uh, institu political spaces. And they are not trained for that. And they are not very good at hosting real conversations, community conversations. Uh, we need to support them yeah. in being able to do that. Yeah. Very good. Raj. That's actually a perfect segue. Um, because uh, when we work with faculty, and we're working with faculty at the, at the higher ed level, uh, to be able to develop the skills to bring contentious issues into their classrooms, and independent of the discipline, so we work with uh, liberal arts and humanities, social sciences, as well as hard sciences. Um, we're learning that there's two things that are really at play in addition to the challenge of doing the work. One simply is that the way in which higher ed academia works, it doesn't actually provide the opportunity to practice the development of these skills. Right? K-12 has a whole set of professional development. There's actually mechanism to do that. Those mechanisms don't really exist as part of your development as a faculty member. And so. There's a set of skills that we actually need to develop in our higher ed faculty. Many of them are intelligent enough, have practiced enough that they've got it, but not because there's some system in place, but because they just developed over time. For many of them, that's not the case. The second issue, which is very consistent with what you're saying, though I'll use different words, is they don't trust that anyone's got their back, right? And unfortunately, there's enough examples, and there just need to be a few, right, of where either chairs, deans, uh, senior level administrators or college presidents do not protect their academic faculty when, frankly, in large part, they're doing the right thing through the right process and things blow up. Because guess what? When you have difficult conversations, things actually can go awry, right? That is okay. That is not a bad thing. But you need that protection and it doesn't exist. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is how do we create the systems that actually support the faculty when they actually do the good work? All right. We're about out of time, as I understand it. Uh -oh. um, I apologize for anyone who has any more questions. Um, go ahead, and you can connect with me, and I will make sure that your questions are heard and seen by our we, panelists. And we will make ourselves available yes, here after this panel for any one-on-one any -on -one questions. I think there's a 10-minute break coming. But if you guys could each just end. Now, we've got to end on a positive note, because that would just be <laughs> bad to talk about division. So give us, uh, this is a challenge, a sentence or two mm -hmm. about the positive something positive with regard to civic education going forward. Oh. I mean, oh, there's we, a lot. I mean, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> we've, we've uh, our team, uh, Abby here, um, it, we've been very successful at getting new legislation passed to ensure that uh, students uh, get civic learning they deserve. Um, so uh, both federal and state. And uh, if we do that, it's a long-term process. Uh, but it's a really important place. That's good. David. There are models of civility, not many of them happening here, for young people to look at. We need to privilege those. And we need to also take confidence in the fact that young people can maintain friendships. They're often doing it and having conversations. So in that sense, look to some of the good things that are happening with their problem-solving skills already in place. And Raj. Ditto, ditto. Um, there are big players, higher education and business, who are recognizing the absolute necessity of developing these skills in young people if we are to have a thriving democracy. Those are big players, lots of power. They're starting to come into this game as, as well. That'll help us. Excellent. Please help me thank our excellent panel. You. You've got a 10-minute break. 10-minute break.